each life we incarnate into has a divine purpose. For the majority of people on this planet, their purpose has eluded them. We have become so distracted with the struggle to survive that we have forgotten what we are here to do. In alignment with the sacred laws of nature, the ultimate purpose of all existence is to create and evolve. We certainly do not incarnate into life with the intention to destroy. And yet, we have come to live in a very destructive world. As a result, there are many out there who feel lost or adrift, whilst knowing deep down inside that something is very wrong with their reality. Many people wish they could do something of value, something, anything that is purposeful, instead of having to submit to a system of slavery in order to survive. It is important never to let go of that feeling. That is your soul crying out to you, telling you that your life has value and that you do indeed have a purpose. The most important thing you can do in life is to recognize your purpose. And often that requires a lot of soul searching. Life indeed dishes out some pretty tough challenges, which will either move you closer towards your purpose path, or will give you great training for when you finally realize what it is that you came here to do. But more often than not, the very clues about your life's purpose are hidden in plain sight woven into the very fabric of our existence. But we are so easily distracted by irrelevant details that don't really matter, that often we miss the very obvious right in front of us. It is because of our willful ignorance of anything that does not fit our preconceived ideas that the truth about the nature of our reality is so readily hidden in plain sight. This is a very deep and personal journey, which has come to be expressed in many aspects throughout my life. This is not just an attempt to retell a bunch of research and pass it off as my own, for I am very grateful and openly acknowledge all the many wonderful people that I have been given the opportunity to work with and to learn from in order to get to the point where I've come to know what I now know. This is a journey I was always destined to go on. And likewise, how I have come to know this information forms as much a part of the story as the information itself. The theme of the dragon was put right in front of me literally from the moment I was born because of the year that I was born. Besides my lifelong obsession with these creatures, I was at some stage bound to question the origins of the dragon. The Shenzhou, better known in English as the Chinese Zodiac, is a scheme that relates each year to an animal and its reputed attributes according to a 12-year mathematical cycle. It has been widely used and its ideologies acknowledged in several East Asian countries such as China, Korea and Japan. Identifying the scheme using the term zodiac reflects several similarities to the Western zodiac. For example, both have time cycles divided into 12 parts. Each label at least the majority of those parts 
with the names of animals, and each is widely associated with a culture and practice of attributing influence of the zodiac to a person's relationships, personality, and even events in their life. Nevertheless, there are major differences between the Sheng Zhao and the Hermetic Zodiac. The Sheng Zhao Chinese 12 part cycle corresponds to the years rather than the months. There are 12 animals represented in the Chinese Zodiac, whereas some of the signs of the Western Zodiac are not animals, despite the implication of the Greek etymology of Zodiac, which means animal wheel. Unlike the characters of the Western Zodiac, the animals of the Chinese Zodiac are not associated with the constellations, nor do they have anything to do with the movements of the stars and the sun. Upon finding out that I was born in the year of the dragon when I was young, I curiously pondered all 11 other representations on the Chinese Zodiac. It was very obvious to me, even as a child, that every creature represented was a very common and easily recognizable animal that most people had knowledge of or had seen, and that most people considered to exist in day-to-day -day reality. The only creature on the Chinese zodiac that did not fit this description was the dragon. Officially, the dragon, much like fairies and mermaids, have been regarded by modern-day society as a mythological creature which is to say that it is not real and does not actually exist, or at least that is what they have taught us in school. This beckons the question, why would there be what we are told is a non-existent creature in the Chinese zodiac? Much like Western Hermetic astrology, Chinese astrology is often used to characterize personality traits of people which corresponds symbolically with the representation on the zodiac. This beckons the next logical question. How can they base characteristics and traits on a creature that did not exist? The use of the dragon in Chinese zodiac is based on something and represents something. It does not fit with the logic of what we've come to know about Chinese astrology that dragons be represented if they did not in fact exist as we have been taught through most mainstream educational circles to believe. Why have other supposedly non-existent mythological creatures such as unicorns not been used in the Chinese zodiac? The only logical answer is that to the people who formatted the Chinese zodiac as we've come to know it, the dragon was a very real creature. So let us consider this for a moment. Are dragons real? And if they are, what about the many other supposedly mythological creatures such as mermaids, vampires, pixies and fairies? Could they have some basis in reality? For those of you who are familiar with my work as Freedom Central, you are probably aware by now that there is so much we are not being told and we have been categorically lied to and programmed into believing in a false version of reality. If I have come to know anything for sure, it's that we must question everything we've been taught. Like so many of the clues in my life, the most important ones were right in front of me. A good example of this is how my first name begins with the letter M, which happens to be the 13th letter in the alphabet. The number 13 is very significant in numerology, but specifically in relation to me, I had always been taught that 13 was a number that was to be hidden. Indeed, many homes would sooner number their homes as 12A than use the number 13. Bringing together the opening themes, it's interesting to note at this point that in the tradition of Western Hermetic Astrology, the 13th astrological sign has also been hidden. Much like Chinese astrology, the Western Hermetic Zodiac only has 12 official representations. The 13th astrological representation of Western Hermetic astrology is called Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Ophiuchus is located between Aquila, serpents and Hercules 
and is situated in the northwest of the center of the Milky Way. The southern part of the constellation of Fucus lies between Scorpius to the west and Sagittarius to the east. In the northern hemisphere, Ophiuchus is best visible in summer and is located opposite Orion in the sky. Ophiuchus is depicted as a man grasping a serpent, whilst the interposition of his body divides the snake constellation serpents into two parts, serpents caput and serpents corda, which are nonetheless counted as one constellation. There is so much that we have been taught to ignore as myth and legend, thus hiding the very obvious in plain sight, as has been the case with the 13th constellation of Ophiuchus. By labelling creatures like dragons as legendary, we have been taught that they are non-historical. The definitions of legendary and mythological have been widely debated, with no widely agreed upon application. However, Interest in mythology has grown steadily throughout the last hundred years, and it has peaked in recent years especially, as the Great Awakening has taken hold of people who are now empowered by the realization that myths are not just pre-scientific explanations of the world, or childish stories made up in order to account for the forces of the universe. Rather, what we consider as mythology provides some accurate insight into reality, Myths and legends exist in all societies and are part of the very fabric of human life, moulding behaviour, expressing beliefs and justifying institutions, as often many superstitions, religions and ritual practices are based upon them. The Encyclopedia of Mythology defines myths as imaginative traditions about nature, history and the destiny of the world the gods, man and society. They are concepts which deserve serious attention for what they mean to those who believe in them and as a statement about the fundamental issues in life. One of the disadvantages of the old-fashioned derogatory use of the word myth to mean a foolish story or a false idea is the implication that myths are trivial. The reality is in fact the reverse. It is the things which people find important which find place in their mythology. The patterns and similarities between dragons of distant geographical regions indicate that whatever the dragon race is or was, at some point, they were absolutely everywhere. They are equally revered, worshipped, loved and feared by almost every ancient culture of our planet. Dragons took on many forms as different cultures interpreted these creatures in their own language symbolism and artistic representations. Despite the fact that the dragon has been represented in many different ways, the basic stories, themes and symbolism tie together all these creatures across all different cultures of history. A secret organization, the self-proclaimed Illuminated Ones, recorded the history of humanity primarily through covert symbolism. Considered the root of all knowledge, the dragon's bloodline is consistent of illumination and emblematic of the sun, which is a symbol of creation, just as the dragons are credited in many ancient cultures as being our creators. Dragons are intrinsically linked to light, knowledge or illumination and are often referred to in Judaic literature as the Shining Ones. Before we go further, it is important to be able to decipher the hidden symbolism of the dragon, which is hidden in plain sight, which will make it easier to reference and contextualize the rest of this material in its rich and multi-layered format. Let's start with the physical appearances of dragons. Dragons are often depicted with long serpent-like bodies, which are sometimes winged, feathered and sometimes have plumage on the top of their heads. Dragons are often symbolically represented as serpents or snakes. They are often depicted with fish-like scales and they are often associated with water, oceans, seas, rivers and wells. The Ouroboros is often depicted as encircling the world 
and as an extension of this is often depicted as carrying the world much like Atlas which is a representation of the dragon. Another extension of this symbol is the grasping of an orb common in East Asian dragons. Dragons are thought to feast on humans and or drink human blood. They have an appetite or obsession with gold and silver. Dragons are thought to be able to shapeshift and are often depicted as half human, half fish or half serpent, as if in the middle of a metamorphosis. In many cultures, they are attributed as being our creators or gods. Royalty, kings, queens, and emperors are said to be descended from the dragon. Thus, dragons are often depicted wearing crowns. Dragons are often guardians of churches, temples, shrines, castles, palaces and other sacred places. Associated with the sun, moon, stars, gods and heavens, the Draco constellation give even a further homage to the supposedly non-existent creatures. Dragons are commonly hidden by symbols such as the all-seeing eye, found in several religions, or an anthropomorphic sun symbol. Sun symbolism evolved into the cross symbol, which became the symbol of Christianity. The Christian cross is an actual evolution of the pagan cross, which does not represent the cross of the crucifixion, but rather stems from the cross of the Western Hermetic Zodiac, which is the oldest conceptual image known to man. The Hermetic Zodiac tracks the sun's travels across the sky through the year. The vertical and horizontal lines mark out the solstice and equinox. Often serpents are hung around crosses in ancient Christian mythology, and there is constant reoccurring parallel stories of dragons being slaughtered by saints and angels. There is a reoccurring mythology throughout the world about dragons being at war with the gods or the angels or even with each other. Dragons are symbols of knowledge and wisdom, which is why they are largely hidden, which is why they are historically a symbol of the occult. The word occult simply means hidden. Dragons and serpents have long since been thought to be part of the revelation of knowledge and wisdom and the freeing of humanity. Paradoxically though, they are also known as the enslavers of humanity. Dragons are often depicted dualistically and are dualistic in nature, exhibiting both qualities of light and dark, which is symbolized by the yin and yang symbol. Due to this, they are often associated or depicted with mirrors or having an aversion to mirrors.
This theme is further expanded by the repeated representation of dragons with multiple heads. A common reoccurring theme within many mythologies is the Tree of Life, or the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, often to be found within many serpent and dragon mythologies. The creation of music and instruments are often associated with dragons and their symbolism, including harps, horns and flutes. Serpents are a symbol of medicine, healing, fertility and sex. There is repeatedly occurring mythology about dragons raping, having sex, or breeding with humans. Eggs are often found in dragon-themed art, and serpents are often depicted as being wrapped around them. Serpents are often found underfoot the mother goddess standing on a moon. Owls, eagle, the phoenix, peacocks, and Garudas have all been associated with dragons. Other creatures known to be used to symbolize the dragon include lions, which are also a symbol of the sun, foxes, horses, sphinxes, dogs, crocodiles, lizards, and bats. In fact, Dragons have been so widely recorded in all parts of the world and through all different times and civilizations that they have taken on other forms and characteristics in folklore and fairy tale and have been artistically represented as such. Upon exploring the mythology of dragons or the serpentine race from all over the world, it becomes easier to recognize the reoccurring themes and symbolism, especially when you look at our language and the words of expression we ignorantly use, not knowing the occult meaning. By examining the etymology associated with these creatures and understanding how we have been programmed into serpentine thinking through the very language we use, goes a long way into proving the existence of dragons and the influence on ancient cultures and especially their influence and hold on society today, despite the fact that most people do not know that these creatures even exist. Etymology is the study of words stemming from the Greek word etymos, which means true. The truth about the serpentine race is hidden in the very language we use. A way into the mind of ancient cultures can be through architecture, pictures, paintings, sculpture, and especially writings. We have to actively seek out the symbols and true meanings by which the utterances were spoken and written in order to grasp the clues to the reality and thinking of those of the past. 
A written word is a symbol and an expression of an idea. To penetrate to the word's inner meaning is to look into the minds of the people who spoke and wrote the word. Language paints the intellectual landscape and provides the blueprint for thought. An exploration of serpentine mythology provides convincing evidence as to the existence of dragons. Words containing the root word ofi, which is a serpentine word, usually have some sort of dragon or serpentine association. An example of this is found in the root of the 13th symbol of the Hermetic Zodiac, being Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Now before we go into more words that come from the same serpentine etymological roots, cross-reference these words against some of the themes already discussed.
haven't taken the time to explore dragon and serpentine etymology, we now take a look at the other common creatures in popular mythology that are known by other names and representations but are in fact dragons. Again, we approach this through the etymological route. In the occult language of Latin, one of the expressions of the word snake or serpent translates into anguem or anguis. From this, we get the word anguish and anger. The word anglo stems from this root and thus England and English also came from the same serpentine roots. In fact, the Dutch word for angel and English is the same, giving further weight to the point that English is the language of the angels, and angels are in fact dragons, thus making English a serpentine language. There are many types of angels, all invocative of serpent origins. For example, the group of angels known as the Seraphim, which has the same Othi root, with the O being replaced by the A. As often, vowels are substituted with each other as language evolves. In fact, all angels including Cherubim, Puti, and even Cupid are actually representations of the dragon. As already discussed, royalty are inextricably linked to dragons, and in many cases, they are in fact dragons. A Latin word for king is Basileus. This invokes the next serpentine creature, the Basilisk, known as the King of Serpents, and is said to be able to have the power to cause death with a single glance. The Basilisk is often depicted as a cockatrice, which is a dragon with some features belonging to a cockerel, hence the appearance of cockerels on the top of some churches. The Leviathan is a sea monster referenced in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. The word has become synonymous with any large sea creature or monster. The Leviathan of the Middle Ages was used as an image of Satan, endangering both God's creatures by attempting to eat them and God's creation by threatening it with upheaval in the waters of chaos. The Leviathan has been described as the demon of envy and as one of the seven princes of hell, corresponding to the seven deadly sins. Leviathan has become associated and may originally have referred to the visual motif of Hellmouth, a monstrous animal into whose mouth the dam disappeared at the Last Judgment, found in Anglo-Saxon art from about 800 AD onwards and is prevalent all over Europe. The notion of vampirism has existed for millennia. Cultures such as the Mesopotamians, Hebrews, ancient Greeks and Romans had tales of demons and spirits which are considered precursors to modern vampires. However, despite the occurrence of vampire-like creatures in these ancient civilizations, the folklore for the entity we know today as the vampire originates almost exclusively from early 18th century southeastern Europe when verbal traditions of many ethnic groups of the region were recorded and published. In European folklore, a vampire as we've come to know it is a creature which is supposedly a corpse, often with shape-shifting capacities, that leaves the grave at night to drink the blood of the living by biting their necks with long pointed canine teeth. They are also thought to have a sensitivity to sunlight and supposedly sleep in coffins and are one of the most overproduced genres of television series and films known. The griffin is a legendary creature with the body, tail and back legs of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle and an eagle's talons for its front feet. Because the lion was traditionally considered to be the king of the beasts, and the eagle the king of the birds, the griffin was thought to be an especially powerful and majestic creature. The griffin was also thought of as the king of all creatures. Griffins are known for guarding treasures and priceless possessions. One of the expressions of the word griffin is to spell it griffin with a Y-P-H-O-N, which has the serpent offy roots encoded backwards. 
Naga is the Sanskrit and Pali word for a deity or class of entity or being taken the form of a very great snake, specifically the King Cobra, found in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism. A female Naga is a Nagi or a Nagini. In the great epic the Mahabharata, the epic of the Naga tends towards the negative. The epic calls them the persecutors of all creatures and tells us the snakes were of virulent poison, of great prowess and of excess strength and ever so bent on biting other creatures. At some point within the story, Nagas are important players in many of the events narrated in the epic, frequently no more evil and deceitful than other protagonists, and sometimes on the side of good. The epic frequently characterizes the Nagas as having a mixture of human and serpent-like traits. Sometimes it characterizes them as having a human trait at one time and then having a serpent-like trait at another. The word Naga comes from a word that is cognate with the English snake, both sharing the N-A root. A mermaid is a legendary aquatic creature with the upper body of a female human and the tail of a fish. Mermaids appear in folklore of many cultures worldwide, including the Near East, Europe, Africa and Asia. The first stories appeared in ancient Assyria, in which the goddess Astargatus transformed herself into a mermaid out of shame for accidentally killing her human lover. Mermaids are sometimes associated with perilous events such as floods, storms, shipwrecks and drownings. In other folk traditions, or sometimes within the same tradition, they can be benevolent or beneficent, bestowing boons or falling in love with humans. Christopher Columbus reported seeing mermaids whilst exploring the Caribbean, and sightings have been reported in the 20th and 21st centuries in Canada, Israel and Zimbabwe. Mermaids have been popular in the subject of art and literature in recent centuries, such as in Hans Christian Andersen's well-known fairy tale, The Little Mermaid. They have subsequently been depicted in operas, paintings, books, films and comics. In Greek mythology, the sirens were dangerous yet beautiful creatures, portrayed as femme fatales who lured nearby sailors with their enchanting music and voices to be shipwrecked on rocky coasts of their island. In the Euripides play, Helen, in her anguish, calls upon winged maidens, daughters of earth. Although they lured mariners, the Greeks portrayed the sirens in the meadows starred with flowers and not as sea deities. Roman writers link the sirens more closely to the sea as the daughter of Phorcys. Sirens are found in many Greek stories, particularly in Homer's Odyssey. A fairy is a type of mythical being or legendary creature in European folklore, a form of spirit often described as metaphysical and supernatural. Fairies resemble various beings of mythology, but even folklore that uses the term fairy offers many definitions. Sometimes the term describes any magical being including dragons, goblins or gnomes. At other times, the term only describes a specific type of more ethereal creature or sprite. Various folkloristic traditions refer to them euphemistically by names such as fair folk. The jinn are creatures in Islamic tradition and mythology, as well as pre-Islamic Indian mythology. They are mentioned frequently in the Quran and other Islamic texts and inhabit the unseen worlds and dimensions beyond visible universes of humans. The Quran says that the jinn are made of smokeless and scorching fire, but are also physical in nature being able to interfere physically with people and objects, and likewise be acted upon. The jinn, humans and angels make up the three sapient creations of God. Like human beings, the jinn can be good, evil or neutrally benevolent. Jinn is a noun for the collective number, which in Persian literally means hidden from sight, and it derives from the Arabic root meaning to hide or be hidden. Jinn is the plural meaning, one genie, many jinn. The word genie in English is derived from the Latin genius, meaning a sort of tutelary or guardian spirit thought to be assigned to each person at birth. 
English borrowed the French descendant of this word, genie, its earliest written attestation in English being in 1655 from the French translators of the Book of 1001 Nights, which used genie as a translation from genie because it was similar to the Arabic word both in sound and meaning. This use was also adopted in English and has since been dominant. The concept of the genie in the lamp was further popularized by the legendary performance of Robin Williams in the Walt Disney classic Aladdin. The various gods of the Greek and the Roman pantheon are all angelic, serpentine, dragon-like creatures, including the Gorgons and the Titans. The serpents of the Bible are representational of dragons, including the creational story in the Garden of Eden, the brazen serpent story, where Moses puts the serpent upon a cross, and the dragon in the Book of Revelations. Dragons have been our gods and our devils, and have been characterized both as Lucifer and Satan. Almost all religions feature the occurrence of dragons and serpents in their respective mythologies. This is because all religions stem from serpent worship. Ophiolatreia is the original pagan religion which gave birth to all other religions, polytheistic, monotheistic or otherwise. All religions as we have come to know them today use multi-layered symbolism to mask the true function of the religion, which is ultimately all about the worship of the dragon. The symbolism of the dragon was often preserved in architecture or carved into churches, temples, castles and other sacred places. The sequence of these symbols was thus kept in a secret society of initiated building masons, which evolved into the Freemasons. Obelisks are representations of serpents. A word that is close to obelisk is basilisk. The word basilica comes from the word basilisk. There is an obelisk outside St. Peter's Basilica. Coincidence? The word Vatican means divining serpent. The Hagia Sophia is a 2000 year old Catholic cathedral in Istanbul, Turkey. The name Sophia comes from serpent origins. If one looks at the Latin name of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, it is known as the Sancta Sapienta. Sancta invokes sanctuary and sapien means serpent, hence Hagia Sophia being the home of the serpent. Dragon symbolism is often included in the carvings and architecture of churches, temples and other sacred places. Hagia Sophia has many columns taken from older temples and palaces. The word column invokes the word kaluba, which is another Latin word for serpent. In 1007 AD, the Roman Emperor Basil II commissioned a sculpture of a basilisk, which he gifted to the Basilica of St. Ambrosio. Before TVs and newspaper, the most useful tool of propaganda was art and sculpture. The grand masters of the masterpieces which adorned various cathedrals, basilicas, churches and palaces of the world were also, by and large, members of dragon-worshipping secret societies. For anybody who has seen the Da Vinci Code, you will already be aware that Leonardo da Vinci was an initiated member of the Priory of Sion, entrusted with occult knowledge which he included in his artworks. The amazing artworks that adorn Vatican City are all propaganda pieces commissioned by those that wish to create an image in the mind of others by portraying elaborate religious scenes, often hiding important clues and symbolism therein. Some of these artists would sign their work with occult symbols instead of using their name. One such artist was German Renaissance painter known as Lucas Cranach the Elder. He was the court painter to the electors of Saxony for most of his career. He was initiated into a secret society in 1508, 
where he was given the emblem of the black winged dragon wearing a crown with a ruby ring in its mouth. From this date onwards, Lucas Cranach only signed his work with this symbol. In almost every cultural mythology across the world, there is an overwhelming reoccurrence of dragons and serpents in literature, art, sculpture, and ritual, playing into the lives and the history of the past peoples. All religions, cults, and ritual practices, including most modern-day entertainment, such as ball sport, theater, and music, is all rooted in dragon worship.